So my name is Jennifer, and I work here. So you, if you come into the library, you probably have seen me. Um, and we have our authors and our blogger here today. So here is Adele Young. Um, Adele is a author, a voice actor, an artist, a costume creator, and a video game enthusiast. She created the Cycle of Six Moons trilogy, and um, in it, our hero, Michelle, is transported via virtual reality into the very real world of stars, where she interrupts the cycle of the moon, setting in motion the sure end of the world. So her job to save civilization, she needs to rescue the prince and overcome the curse that she created by being there. So all three books are available, and um, you can find Adele outside of the library. You can find her on Instagram, Twitter, um, her Facebook page, and her website. And the books are also available in the library. Awesome. Uh, we have our blogger, Jessalyn. Jessalyn? Yeah. So, uh, she's a high school student, book reviewer, and she runs the blog, Blogging Everything Beautiful. She posts new posts about every three or three, three to four times a week, and um, her book. She does um, memes and book covers. She interviews other bloggers and authors, and she talks about artsy topics. You can find her on Twitter and Instagram with um, the handle at jbelk books. J books. And Jess Flower um, has written three novels, several screenplays plays for theater, and published articles and short stories. He's the author of the Red Bird Trilogy, and um, it begins with an orphan, Jordy, who gets a mysterious gift for himself and his uncle, Carver, who is his caretaker, and they fly to the Czech Republic. They follow their mystical tour guide, who is a red bird, and um, embark on an adventure through the old world to rescue Jordy's parents from the evil clutches of legendary characters that you find are actually familiar. Um, you can follow Jess on Twitter and um, at his website. Everybody. Yep. All right. Um, so we are all together as a panel because we have interest in young adult fiction. So what is young adult fiction and how is it separate from other genres? Do you want to start? Or? <laughs> For sure. I mean, uh, it's interesting that people say uh, young adult fiction has really become its own genre in the last few years. You know, for those of us that, you know, are a little bit older, you know, you look back at some of the books that have been created that technically would be considered YA back in the day, but to us it was just writing. So, you know, as a kind of a genre that started its popularity very recently, it's something that, you know, I'm not going to speak for, for them, but for me it's interesting because there's a reality to it. Uh, there's kind of a, uh, uh, what I think is kind of an interesting aspect is it's written oftentimes from a young person's point of view. And so that's why I think some of it has gained some of the popularity that it has today as opposed to, you know, something that's like some old person writing about a young person trying to put their thoughts and ideas into a young person's scenario. So, anybody else? Um, I think that has a lot to do with it, like being in the moment with the teenage character and not necessarily like looking back on the experiences as a teenager, which would be the difference between like, uh, like the Hunger Games versus some other book groups that may in the point of view of the teenager. Yeah. Do you guys have any examples? Very good. No? Okay. <laughs> um, so that then brings forth a question like, oh, did you want to? No, no I no. agree. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really written only for the young adult age group? Is it only for teenagers or is it also for like the other age group? What do you guys think about that? Oh, well, I think, um, Pretty much not really. I think that young adult is more like, um, I think people look on the back of the cover and see that it says 12 and up or 14 and up, and that's not, I think that tends to um, influence them to shy away mm -hmm. from picking up the novel. So I think that um, you should, if you're interested in the novel and you can, if you can resonate with the character or the plot or anything, you should pick it up because you don't know what's in the novel. Um, 
So I think that um, young adult isn't only for teenagers. I think that anyone should really pick it up just because there's something in the novel that you might be able to understand or um, relate to. Yeah. I would agree with that. I mean, and I know that this is not necessarily literary fiction in terms of this example, but how many people have ever seen a Pixar movie, you know, that are in here? Uh, are those only for children? You know, I would venture to say no. I mean, I know that they are marketed toward families or children, but I mean, and I may just be a kid at heart, but when I watch them, I get enjoyment out of it. You know, I find myself, you know, in the middle of it going, oh my gosh, you know, starting to cry over a particular <laughs> choice that a character makes or something that happens, and it's entertaining me. So, you know, to me, I think it's, I think what Jesslyn said is right. It really should span uh, the audience and really be interested more than just that particular age group. Um, well, when I was growing up, I actually didn't really like reading, mostly because the books that they made us read in school were boring and too preachy and stuff. So when I did actually like to read, it wasn't until college, and I was reading a lot of young adult books. And it was, I guess that what made me get into it was the fact that I could actually relate to the characters, and I felt like I wasn't actually being, like, preached at. Like, I could understand the choices that the characters made and the the way that it's written makes the characters seem powerful and they're in charge of their own lives rather than um, they they need their hand held by an adult. What do you guys think about what makes it like more relatable about young adult versus something that's written for a teenager but it's not young adult? For sure. Just let me think oh, um, I was thinking that um, I think it depends on who you are and if you can, um, if you enjoy the novel and you think that it centers around something that you're interested in or um, that you've um, experienced, then you should be able to relate to the novel. Um, I know this is kind of debatable just because if you're a child reading about a tough topic such as mental illness or abuse, it might not be appropriate for the child to be reading it. But I think it depends on the reader itself and if you're mature and if you're able to relate to the characters. To me, it's POV. You know, for a point of view, if if a care if a book is uh, centered around the point of view of a young person and they're discovering either the problem or the situation or overcoming the conflict from their point of view, I think that kind of erases that whole preachy mentality because they're experiencing it, and we as readers get a chance to experience the same thing through their eyes, uh, as opposed to sometimes just a third. And it doesn't mean you can't write it in third person. But if you can get that sense of the character understanding it, maybe, uh, I mean, it's a pretty fast example, but Harry Potter is probably a very good example in that in terms of it's written from the third person, but we are still experiencing the story and all of the unfolding things through Harry's eyes, right? And so, you know, there are definite themes and messages that, you know, Rowling tried to uh, put into her books, but I don't think any of us ever said, ah, she's trying to shut this message of good and evil down our throats, but we just experienced it through uh, the character's eyes. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. And I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I think uh, that was very well put, and I don't think I have anything to add to that. <laughs> um, so, do we want to ask questions about that particular topic, about what young adult fiction is? Does anybody have any questions about that? The people in our audience, do you guys read or write young adult fiction as well? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I have a child's book. It's a little bit lower level than young adult. And I work in an uh, elementary school, and every year there's a book fair that comes in. They're going to be children's books. I just bought one. I mean, I buy a lot of them, but <laughs> they're, you know, great. And this one was so good mm -hmm. that it got me to researching what was in the story. That's so true. you don't know what precious gems you might get from children's books. Yeah, it was true. awesome. It's called The Merc. Good. <laughs> so I guess that brings us to our next topic about what young adult is like for a reader or a blogger. <laughs> so um, in general, I think that blogging um, has definitely changed my reading experience. Before I started blogging, I was never picking up books out of my comfort zone. I was reading only young adult. Right now I'm reading graphic novels, um, a new adult fiction. So um, I think that blogging as a reader has changed um, the way I read. Um, I think also the way I collaborate with authors and bloggers. Um, I've had the opportunity to talk with bloggers um, 
on the internet, but also um, authors. Um, I've been to many events to talk to them. So I think that um, they've changed the way I've, I've, I'm reading just because I'm going out and picking up other books. Um, I'm doing research about the books I'm doing. I'm reading so I can um, I can decide whether or not it's my time, really. So, um, um, yeah. So you've covered, uh, do, you've done some promotional stuff on your blog as well. How does that, how do you feel about doing that when, like, collaborating with the author and doing the interviews with them and then promoting the work? Um, I think I really enjoy really or, or collaborating with the authors because I'm usually uh, promoting a diverse book or, um, and when I say diverse, I mean um, like LGBTQ community or um, uh, an author of color or something like that. So I really enjoy promoting that just because I'm also a person of color and you don't see that a lot. And on the shelves when you go outside, you don't see a lot of books that are um, promoted um, like that. So I, I really enjoy promoting on my blog. So do you get, um, you must, I, I imagine you mostly get like positive feedback with that. Do you ever like encounter people who just don't want to see diversity in their books? Um, I, not on my blog in specific, but I've seen a lot of things on um, like Twitter, sure. social media, things like that, how there's this divide between whether we should have diverse books or whether we should not, or if is this book really diverse or is the author misrepresenting the characters. So I think I haven't seen it on my blog, but um, social media, yeah. So Jess, when, when you're um, reading a book, or when, you, when you've heard of a book on social media that is getting some backlash um, about being not a great representation of a, of a diverse character, or a diverse story, um, do you ever read them just to see your interpretation? Yeah, um, I usually read it. I might read it depends on what the um, what the representation is the misrepresentation is um but usually i go and do my research i go on goodreads which is a um really big review site and i go on goodreads and i look at the reviews and i see whether or not um where the division is between the two points of view so yeah um, if you're a high school student does anybody else like affect your personal opinion um um, I have a best friend, she also loves reading, but I think that um, we both have the same mindset, so she'll read young adult, I read my young adult, so we usually collaborate and we're like, did you like this book? If you don't, then I probably won't read it, but I'll probably read it anyway. Um, mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's hard being in a, or it's definitely difficult to be a high school student and to blog at the same time, but it's, um, it's also helped me like um, balance my time, um, make sure I'm putting enough work into school, but also my blog, yeah. so. Does she contribute to your blog, too? Oh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> we used to have a lifestyle blog, like, in fourth grade, but that didn't work out well, <laughs> so. <laughs> so how long have you been blogging? Um, over, a little bit over a year and a half. Okay, has the genre changed drastically since you started? Um, not really, um, like I said, I've been reading young adults since I was pretty young, but I've also been picking up other books, like graphic novels and new adults, so. Okay. Can I ask why you started blogging? Um, I, I needed a place to where I could just express what I wanted to say without going on Goodreads and writing a small review. I wanted to um, reach other people besides people that were on Goodreads. So I wanted to touch other authors and other bloggers and really um, collaborate with them on the comments. Even if, the, if it was just the comments section, I was talking to them and I was getting new perspectives and I really enjoyed that. So as a high school student, does your do you find your academic reading to interfere with your pleasure reading? Um, That's a good question. Yeah, <laughs> um, I was assigned a book last year for English, and I didn't find myself interested in it. So usually when I'm reading for personal pleasure, I if I'm not enjoying it, I'll put it down. And for English, I wasn't able to do that because I was I had tests that um, that revolved around the book. So come on, what was it? <laughs> what was um, the book? Yes, yes. Things Fall Apart by oh. Chinua Achibi. Okay. Yeah, um, it was it was different probably from what I'm used to reading. That's probably why I didn't enjoy it as much. Um, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a good question. I was interested. Question back there? On that same train of thought, have you read a book in a high school that was assigned to you that influenced how you interpreted a book that you read in high um, Recently, I read, um, since I'm a junior in high school, we're, we're required to read um, three books um, Great Gatsby, um, um, Candide, and The Grapes of Wrath. 
We've only read The Great Gatsby, but I think that one has. Um, his, my English teacher, he's really good at analyzing books, and I really appreciate that. So when we went through reading Great Gatsby, I was able to resonate with the characters. I was, we looked at themes and um, different um, writing devices that, <laughs> that, um, that really helped me enjoy the book rather than just to read it, put it down, and then. Um, no, <laughs> um, I used to use. Can you repeat the question? Oh, it was. Do I does have does someone help me with graphics or okay. anything on my blog? And the answer is no. Um, I also um, I used to use an app on my phone, like a common app that everyone uses to make my graphics. But then recently, starting this year, actually, I've been looking at other um, websites, and then right now I'm using Canva. And um, it's a really good website, so if you're looking to make graphics for your blog, you should use that one. Um, but yeah, I use Canva right now. If you haven't seen her blog, too, it's beautiful. I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah. it really looks like it's really professional like that. And it is, you know, so. And that was Canva, like in Canvas? Oh, I don't know. It's just canva.com. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess then we'll go on to the creative process about what it's like to write young adult fiction. Uh, so. I am a plotter, and Jess is a pantser. So do you <laughs> guys know what that means? Has anybody ever heard that term before? Plotter versus pantser? Okay. So it may behoove us to ex okay. explain what those are. So what I do when I write is that before I actually start writing, I write an extensive um, outline with like character biographies and terminology and I do research on the location, and then I write a chapter by chapter outline about basically what's going to happen. It doesn't always have to be super detailed, but I'm a plotter, so that's what I do. And a pantser is somebody that writes by the seat of their pants. Same so what they do, what I do, is I have a general idea, like kind of a three-act structure is the way I have it. So I know that I want to start here. I know that this bad stuff is probably going to happen. And then I know that I'm going to have them get out of it in this particular end result. But then in the middle of that, I'll just throw characters into situations and just see what happens. So there's good and bad to both sides, obviously, for me. The good is, is that's the way I have fun. It's the way I write. It's the way that my creative process works. The bad is I've written myself into some really bad uh, corners that I don't know how to get up, get out of, and I'll have to actually go back and even sometimes redo stuff altogether. Say, well, that didn't work, you know. But sometimes I'll be able to keep something that I liked that I wrote in that particular section and just save it for something else or maybe a different book altogether. But that's just the way I do it. So sometimes my process will take a lot longer, too. And then for Adele, you can speak to the maybe pros and cons of that, or if you want to, or of, of like plotting. OK, so well, I don't know if there really are any cons with that. <laughs> <laughs> so I were this past December, I finished a book for I tried to do NaNoWriMo in December. Do you guys know what NaNoWriMo is? Yeah, OK, so it's. It generally takes place in November, and it stands for National Novel Writing Month. Yeah. Um, and the goal is to write 50,000 words in 30 days. So that averages out to be about 1,667 words per day. But I did that in December as kind of a more of a personal goal. And I feel like taking the months prior to actually doing the writing itself and making an outline helps a lot with um, writing everything out as quick as I can and just getting the words on the page. So, um, yeah, like having an outline helps me write faster. So that's basically what it is. I don't know if there are any cons for that. Yeah. I, I can think of just one con. Because I'm more like you, it would frustrate me to have to plot everything out and not get to the story. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that would be the only con I would see in plotting. Yeah, the question Have you guys tried the other way around? Like, have you tried camping and plotting? Um, well, in my most recent book that I finished in December, there was a part where I tried to write and uh, I had like a general idea of what I wanted to do with it, but then once I got the characters into the scene, it just started going off the rails, and I just didn't like it. It was like this is crazy, and I ended up scrapping. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you were saying about having yeah. the frustration of yeah. not actually feeling. Yeah. 
um, writing at that moment, I use that frustration to feel when I actually yeah. get around to writing. So yeah. it's like, I let it build up inside of me so when I actually get the chance to write down, mm -hmm. it just, it goes out like quickly. Instead of just like, cool. just sitting there and thinking about what I'm gonna do next. And just to throw this out for Adele, she's way more prolific than I am. You know, I mean, it's so right there. You know, we both have trilogies. Mm -hmm. Here's my trilogy. <laughs> Here's her trilogy, right? So she's got all three done. She's been working on stuff. I mean, every time we, you know, we'll kind of share stories. She's already done so much more. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So that's, you know, really the con for me is I don't, I don't write as fast. So. What tips would you give a, a young aspiring author? Write what's important to you and not what you think that people want. Like it's, I feel it's more important to be genuine to your craft than to try to sell out. What do you mean by sell out? By trying to write with what's hot and even if it goes against what you love writing. Like, so let's say you're gonna write... Vampires. Yeah, <laughs> like vampire romance or something like that. And you know, you, you're tired of that and you don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> My advice is, if, if I can chime in, read a lot and write a lot. You know, uh, if you read a lot, you get a chance to emulate people that you enjoy, or you get to steer away from tropes that you don't like, uh, but all the, obviously it just helps to increase, you know, you'll read something and say, wow, that was amazing, I really hope to be like that someday, or you might read something that's like, wow, I know for sure I can do better than that. And both sides are really helpful in the writing process, and if you're a good reader, you'll be a good writer, for sure. What are your relationships like with your editor? Are, is there any fear that they might uh, get too intrusive, remove your voice. Good question. Do you want to go first? I don't have an editor. <laughs> <laughs> do you, you self-help? Yeah. Yeah, so that maybe bridges to another conversation that we can have either now or later, but um, both of uh, Adele and myself have actually gone the route of really publishing our own work. Uh, with that, if you have people in your life that are uh, good, you know, second readers, you know, a lot of times to catch stuff that we miss, that's wonderful, but both of us have done a majority of our own proofreading, so I can pretty much guarantee that if you pick up my book, you'll probably find a couple things that's like, well, that's a mistake, and yeah, it may be, you know, um, but because of that, uh, it's interesting the way the whole publishing community looks now, um, because it's very difficult uh, to get traditional publishing as kind of the publishing industry has gone down a little bit. So I, I'm not going to speak on behalf of Adele, but for ourselves, I know we have discussed saying this is the way that we want to make sure our work gets out there uh, as soon as possible so that we can even hopefully build a platform for ourselves. But great question. So do we want to start going on traditional publishing then? Or? We could. Okay. So the way what most people think about publishing is a traditional route, which is like um, getting a literary agent and having them go to like the big five publishing houses yeah. and then getting like a million dollar deal and then you pick up royalties after that. Right. But that's really difficult. It's very difficult. <laughs> so the first um, step in going about a traditional publication would be to get a literary agent. So a literary agent is somebody who picks up your book and takes it over to the editors, probably in New York, and tells them, this is a great book, this will be hot, we need to sell it, and this is why. Right. And then they try to get the be best deal that they can get you as a writer, because the more that you make as a writer, the more that they make as an agent. So, warning, you should never pay a literary agent up front, because if you do, that's a scam. <laughs> yeah. So, again, the more money that you make, the more money that they make. So that's their job to do that. You need to, in order to get a literary agent, you need to write a query letter. And a query letter is basically like a cover letter about what your book is and why you are contacting that person in particular. Like, maybe they, they represent young adult fiction. But you don't want to just send it out to anybody, because if they only do self-help books, then they're not going to be much help to you. And do you want to share your experience? Yeah, sure. I mean, with that, it's tough because literary agents, obviously, what's their number one goal is to make money. I mean, their goal is to find something that will sell. So a lot of times, and I'm not saying this is the case for every literary agent, but a lot of times they're thinking, I don't really care how special your story was to yourself. i got to get what the publishers are going to buy. 
So as we you know, shared our advice of, hey, write what's in your heart, write what's important to you, that's exactly what you do. On the flip side, literary is like, hey, vampire romance are hot right now, I'm only gonna buy those. So what happens is, is it becomes difficult to find that person that says, I'm gonna be confident enough to put you up. Now the interesting thing too is, they don't just look for the strength of your work, they will look for how marketable you are, how many more books you're going to write? So if you're a you know a, a, you know a kill a mockingbird person that's released one thing, they're probably not going to think that you're very valuable to them for the future. They want somebody you know hopefully like Adele that's like they're going to put out a new book all the time, so that way there's always that resource coming in for them. So it's a very competitive market to get that. And query letter is one way. The other way is if you can get yourself into areas where those literary agents are hanging out, that's a wonderful place too, because then you can just meet and share, and they might just like you as a person, and say, well, I think you have a lot, and you know, what else do you have? And then they can maybe hopefully represent you from that too. Uh, yeah. Question? And Questions? research your literary agent. Yeah. I was a private investigator at the time, and I, I was writing screenplays at the time, and I failed to research the, the literary agent. It because I had a reputable company I was going to. And so I sent them a query letter. Letter They lost it. Oh, gosh. Guy calls back and says, you sent me your scripts to me. And he gives me his name. I'm thinking, he's so strong. Must be a, Must an be agent, legit. right? I sent him 11 scripts before I found out that he was a con man. Oh, no. <laughs> Where he was a receptionist pretending to be an agent. So research your literary agents, real good. How do you get literary agents? How, uh, where do you write to? Or how? Um, there I, was I, a book, oh, I forgot the name of it, it's like Writer's Market. Yeah. Writer's, Writer's Digest Market. Guide? Yeah. yeah, there's like the Writer's Digest Guide and then there's like the Writer's Market book. There's like yeah. this huge they book that you can yearly. find. Yeah. yeah, and they have publishers and literary agents listed in them, but I've actually seen some of them aren't yeah. reputable agents, so I don't know how they get their names in there, but um, it's good to you know research them. And then there's also a website called QueryTracker.net, um, and you can. Last time I played with it, like a few years ago, um, you can put input your the genre that you write, and it comes up with a list of various literary agents and their email addresses. Whether they take snail mail only or email, a lot of them are. Thankfully, taking only email yeah. nowadays because you know I don't want to spend money for scams. There's a question. Oh, yeah. I actually just wanted to say there's also a website called manuscriptwishlist.com oh, yeah. where agents can post their specific requests and what they're looking for. Yeah. I think there's also a, a, a hashtag on Twitter, um, MSWL. MS, MSWL. MSWL. Yeah. And that is helpful because they'll say, man, I want a story about this or I want. Of, you know, somebody give me a book about, you know, Amish romance or something like that. And then that really helps to kind of find out, ooh, that's my gig, and then you can contact them directly. What was the last one? MS? Uh, MS? Manuscript wish list. So MS It's the hashtag on Twitter if, you, yeah. if you're on Twitter. Or manuscript wish list. <laughs> Dot com. Yeah, that. you can just Google it. And what was the one before that? QueryTracker.net. Uh, tracker. QueryTracker.net. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, if you go on writersdigest.com, you can probably just Google it. They have a guide to new literary agents and what they're representing. And most often, if they are posted on there, then they are seeking new authors. And that's also another thing. Like, a lot of big literary agents have so many clients that they are not really receptive to taking new clients. So it's a lot harder to get in the door. See, I, I did read both of your books, and I've been trying to follow your blog. I'm not a super blog. It's not anything personal. <laughs> Blogs are not my thing. Um, <laughs> she got the books. <laughs> but um, so with um, with your stories, so Adele, her story, obviously, it starts out with the, the video game aspect. And then in your story, there's a lot of travel and um, mythical or legendary um, stories that are intertwined into your story. So how do you both do your research for um, for you, you did legendary mystical stories, and for Adele, her, her entire world was made up 
from your head. So how do you research something that is all just from you? So I don't know. Whatever, whatever order you want to go in. Uh, I'll start with mine because I think it's simpler. For me, uh, the research came with a lot of, and it sounds really funny, but if I'm setting, my characters go to Prague, uh, and I've never been to Prague, right? Um, so Google Maps has, and so just literally go <laughs> So literally going to Google Maps and you know how you do the street view where you can put, so I would just put myself in that situation and just look around on the computer and say, oh, that's cool. And uh, for me, particularly, I had to look for a specific statue that, that I knew and had researched was in that area of Prague. And so I was literally going through the streets, uh, much like the characters do, looking for this particular statue. And so when I, sorry Siri, I'll, I'll speak louder. So when I, uh, so when I did that, it's just a, really a, a, an idea of doing that. But remember, it's not just about visual. So when I put myself there, I would try to say, well, what what street vendors would be out right now? Uh, you know, what would the smells be like in this area? What season am I in? Uh, you know, what would it feel like? So I don't know if I conveyed that or not in my story, but I tried to really uh, put myself in that situation, other than just visually. Then in terms of some of the different mythical things that they run into, um, it was really a lot of just researching them, old stories, and some of the stuff goes into kind of Norse legend, and so I was kind of really trying to research some of those and find out what aspects I liked about that, and then where I wanted to take my personal artistic license and say, well, I want that character to not look like that, but I want him or her to look like this. So it was really just a matter of researching and then kind of tailoring it to make my own because that's what we get to do as writers, right? So. Okay, so with my book, The Psycho of the Six Moons, um, I created a map of stars and um, I use that and just like looking at what's closer to the equator and it's weird. Okay, so I studied psychology back in college and there's this one book that I just the class is amazing, it's social psychology. And something that I learned about it was that those people closer to the equator are more touchy-feely in greeting other people than are those closer to the poles. So like, it's they're literally warmer and those closer to the poles are literally colder. So um, uh, that was something that I thought about when I was like looking at my map and where the cities are located and then also like, like what kind of agriculture they would have, just kind of thinking about it in terms like of the real world. Like maybe this place has more fishing or they have like forests and like another place would be more mining or something like that. So it's just kind of like bringing the real world into a fantasy world and trying to make it more realistic and understanding. So that was like, that's basically how my world building goes. Um, Cause like the world is fantasy and it's totally made up, but I still want to make it relatable and kind of at home. Cool. Um, so, Jessalyn, when you're, when you're doing book reviews and things, do you look for, um, for self-published books, like from Jess or Adele? Um, um, usually yes, but you sh um, when I'm blogging or when I'm on Goodreads, there's mostly not self-published books that are promoted. So I, I, I really go try and go out of my way to find the indie publishers or the indie bookstores or something like that cool. to really find other, maybe not so popular books, but I might enjoy that one eventually. So. When it comes to your blogging, your reviewing, because um, you're going to be the author, right? Yeah. Are you ever privy to whether their fathers were cancers or do they sell that information to you? Um, or just basically talk about the book? Yeah. It's more about the book. Um, usually, if I am interested in their writing process, I'll probably ask them about it. But um, usually, it's not something we usually <laughs> we talk about um, via email. It's usually, um, what's your book about? Can I get your social media? Um, um, how do you want me to promote your book? Do you want me to write the post myself, or are you going to send me um, the stuff for it? So. There's one in the back. I had a question about your is there any program that you use in particular to kind of help you organize your thoughts and get this on paper so you don't lose your great ideas? I just use Microsoft Word. It's yeah. not the best <laughs> organization tool, but it works. And there's a control fine thing, so like, right. yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I, I'm a Pages guy for some reason. Just I write on a Mac, and so Pages is kind of the, the, the uh, 
the software program that I use. But that's a great question because I know that when I do a document, I'll have particular thoughts that'll come and I don't want to lose that. And so I'll just put a bunch of asterisks and just da, 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 don't forget and I'll just leave myself a note in the document. And sometimes I can just easily find that and say, oh, and as I'm kind of developing the story, I go fairly linearly. Wow, it's a lot of notes. Uh, and so as I go through, I will go back and say, oh yeah, I forgot to put that in or something like that. Does that answer that question? Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> I don't have a program though that keeps track of stuff like Evernotes or you know, things like that. Say again. I've seen it. I haven't per like purchased it though. Yeah, I've heard it's really good. That's what okay. it's like. Was, were you getting it? Okay. Yeah, for writers and stuff. I I need to check it out for sure. And Scrivener with a V, right? Yeah. Okay. Just one, do you ever, um, I know you focus on young adult books, but do you review outside of that genre sometimes? Um, sometimes, yes. Like if I'm asked to um, review the author's middle grade, I'll probably want to pick it up just because I don't want to stick to young adult and I want to reach other bloggers. What if they don't like young adult? What if they read middle grade or new adult? So um, I haven't been reviewing a lot of new adult, but also I've been trying to host giveaways or blog tours for middle grade. And I don't know if everybody knows that, but middle grade is like, what would you say, Jesslyn, what age groups? Well, since I think young or young adult in general is maybe 14 plus, maybe uh, middle grade is maybe anything below 12. And then and then new adult is more of kind of just above yeah. YA? Right? Yeah. Okay. New adult, is that mostly contemporary? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it wouldn't be, it would be weird to say new adult fantasy or yeah. something like that. Okay. Oh. Well, unless there's some, some sexy stuff happening. Yeah. Right. Well, there's some sexy stuff in some young adult books, too. So. <laughs> there's varying degrees of sexy. <laughs> <laughs> what techniques have you used to market your book since you self-published? Uh, Adele's better in it than I am. Uh, I do a lot of just social media posts, and uh, I've tried to do, I've actually tried to do a blog <laughs> and I'm not as disciplined as Jessalyn is either. Basically, what we're rolling down to is I'm not very good at this stuff, <laughs> and these guys are good. No, but what I like to do is the social media aspect, and then I'm really a personal, um, just kind of hands-on. So I'll go into bookstores and just ask, hey, can I get my book on your shelf? And I've had varying degrees of success with that. What social media is Twitter, Facebook, and uh, some Instagram, but not as good. And I can get really put a lot of irons in the fire and then not be good at any of those irons. So I've tried to focus on Facebook and Twitter mainly. Twitter is, for some reason, the one that I, I love. This seems to be a really strong writer's medium. Yeah, it seems like a writer's medium, so I love that. So the question go. Um, well, for my for all three of my books, I tried to get a blog tour for it, and I went through YA Bound Book Tours, and they have services for sale. They have varying degrees of like how much to do like sometimes they have cover reveals or trailer reveals sometimes they just have book blitzes which um which like maybe only happen for a day and just give like the promotional information like what the book is about and then there's a blog tour which has a lot more usually like with extra graphics or excerpts and reviews and stuff like that so that's something that I tried. I don't know how successful it is. And then I'm also a voice actor, so I tried to do um, some promotional videos for it with like my, me and my friends acting as the characters. And I put that up as like uh, book trailers and stuff like that. And then I also draw, so I make graphics and try to share them on social media and be like, hey, it's something for my back. <laughs> Did you do your covers? No. Uh, so my friend Brandon, who is uh, an artist, I asked him to do the books. We were working on a video game together, and I was like, I need a book artist, and I don't want to do it myself. So I asked him to do it. And yeah, so it was a fun experience, because then I can actually have some control over what I have on the covers, rather than just a pretty girl in a dress. <laughs> Yeah, in the process of researching, have you ever done Google Earth? Google what? Google Earth. Yeah, I, uh, you with can the actually drop Google into Maps buildings. and Google Earth. Yeah, those yeah. two I used. You, to you try. can literally drop into buildings and look around. That's I've true. I've done the loop. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's cool. 
Yeah, it is very nice. I tried to do that for my latest book, like going back to 1920 mm -hmm. in San Francisco. It, well, I'm sure it wasn't accurate. It just changed the colors. It was like black and white. Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. That's cool. Very cool. Oh, um, did you guys always know that you wanted to be writers? Um, there's like being a writer and then writing. So when I was in second grade, I wrote my first story for fun. And it was just kind of like, I didn't really consider myself a writer. It was more of a storyteller. And it wasn't until I was about 13 that I like seriously considered looking into what it takes to be published. Similar, very similar. Wrote in school, you know, uh, found that there was some degrees of success with that. You know, people saying, wow, it's really good, or a teacher reading it out loud. And so that's where the confidence built behind it. And then just kept writing and really similar. So, you know, teenage years started saying, hey, I think I want to do this, you know, more as full time as I can. You know, and that's the eventual goal is to just be able to write. Just one about writing. Um, how did you figure out that writing a blog was your platform? Um, well, writing a blog is really different from being just on Goodreads and writing a small review. Um, I really enjoy being able to express what I want to express on a creativity platform that is just for me. So um, I think just being able to write or my, make a blog post is really, it's not easier, but it's more comfortable for me than just going on Goodreads or going on Amazon <laughs> and writing my um, book review. Your blog has a lot of um, opportunity to do variety of things that if you're stuck, if you have a storyline or a trilogy, you're kind of stuck with your plot. But with your blog, I see that you do different things too, like um, you had a quiz that you posted and you had um, interviews with authors and the captivating covers meme that you created. So you have kind of a whole uh, marketing thing for yourself of your blog that I thought was really cool. Thank you. How do you um, build followers? Social media. <laughs> Social media is probably the biggest way to promote myself. Um, I have Twitter, Instagram, Goodreads. Um, I tried Facebook once, but I don't think I'm going to use it, honestly. <laughs> um, so social media, um, really talking to other bloggers. Sometimes they'll want to do, um, like me, I do feature with followers. And I pick followers that I have, and I um, promote them on my blog. So usually I'll go out and try and find someone else else doing the same thing. Um, there's also like um, like reading challenges that'll be able, that um, really helps me promote myself. Um, and then I think that's it. That's great. So I suffer from great cognitive dissonance when I'm trying to figure out how to incorporate the backstory. And I think I made the mistake in my first edition of hitting the reader with just a whole bunch of expository first chapter trying to substantiate why the characters are there, the setting. And so like half my first chapter is just a bunch of facts, sure. dates. How do you develop a backstory in an effective way so that the reader doesn't want to close the book? <laughs> that, I mean, that's a fantastic question. I mean, for me, I'll just say, for me, the, I will want to write the way I want to read. So if I pick up a book and it has that, I'll be honest, I'm like, oh, this, this be, I'm not going to do this. But if I pick up a book that automatically launches me into some conflict or a story or something that's really, you know, the hook, right. then I want to keep reading it. So I want to try to do that same thing. So I think the fact that you developed all that backstory is important. But then you just have to start deciding when and where do I put that in. Is it flashback? How do I do that? And it's more interesting to me if I'm already launched into the middle of a conflict and I want to, and I don't know much about that person or the situation. And then again, this is just the way I read. Then I'll be okay with going back and learning the history behind it. Does that make sense? Yeah. But Adele may have a totally different take. Um, it's pretty much mostly the same thing. Like I. Uh... I generally like to read and write, so the main character is like plunged right into the the beginning of the conflict, like maybe just before the conflict begins. So then you get the chance to like know the character. So when um, you care enough to read about what happens in the past, so like I try to build it up enough so that you're curious about what happens, but without like needing to have an info dump. Like you have just enough to understand what's going on 
until um, it's absolutely necessary to give all that information. No. What do you prefer when you read it? When you get uh, the backstory of like a character's history and whatnot? I think as long as you're not just giving it to me and like there's not, I mean, it's not a historic, I'm, I'm not really a big, um, big historical fiction type of person, so I don't think, I mean as long as it's not, you're just giving me facts that I can look up in a textbook, then it's okay. As long as you're giving me something to go with besides just the facts. I mean, you think about, and again, just because, I'm using this example only because most people know this example, but you don't know how the scar happened on Harry mm -hmm. Potter's head, you don't know about the, the distance of how Dumbledore and you know Gr Grindelwald fought over the wand. You don't know any of that stuff. You just know there's a baby that's being dropped off on a porch. It has a lightning bolt on his head, and you're like, all right, what is the deal with this, right? And then you just start to unravel those things. And so I think Adele said it the best. To say, if you care about that character, then you do want to know more, right? And so, yeah, I think just do that. That's a great question. Thank you. Well, this is such a vague, uh, open-ended thing, but I'm always curious when I hear uh, other writers uh, how you get your inspiration. Where does your inspiration come from? You gave us an outline of kind of how you how you work in general, but uh, and how do you build your characters? Where do you get these character traits from? And and then. Uh, maybe your plot too. What what are your inspirations? Where do you get these ideas from and put them together? And particularly, how do you develop character? And where do you get uh, dream up these? Well, get the idea for the character, and then how do you build them up? Can you tell us a little more in more detail about your process than just the outline of how you operate? Do you want to see it? Okay. Well, both of okay. you. Know, I'm looking at her. She's closer. <laughs> both of you. Okay. I didn't mean to leave you out. No, no, that's fine. Um, well, on Thursday, I had a, a. I was at the teen writing group over at Cordelia, and Marla was there, and over there in the back, and I gave out a, a sheet called. Okay, so the book was called. I don't remember it, but, um, but anyway, it, it was about these archetypes of characters, and you might remember it from. Tok. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are these twelve archetypes of these characters, and they have like various, like there's the innocent and the orphan and the caregiver and the warrior and stuff like that. So they're very they're archetypes and they're very basic, but I feel that helps me in creating a character who's different from me, like finding their fears and aspirations and what drives them. Um, I feel like starting with an archetype when you're when you when you're first introducing the character to yourself, that's helpful. And then once you're actually writing them in the story, that it helps to know like the the basics of them, so you could build upon them and create like an entirely new individual new person. Um, as for the um, inspiration for plot and stuff. So I'm a gamer, and this entire series is pretty much based on what it's like to be in a video game and just embark on an, a fantasy adventure and saving the world with, like, swords and sorcery. Um, so that was a big thing for me, like, just embarking on an adventure, video games, because it's immersive, and you find out that you approach um, conflict differently when you're in a video game, because... You're like, how am I going to approach this situation with like being in an enemy base and then you have to find your way out instead of, you know, just, because you don't do that on a daily basis. So it's, um, that's something that helps me when I'm writing my thing. But as for the plot. Inspiration's weird, you know? I mean, people ask, where do you get your ideas? And it's hard to kind of define what that what that happens, but uh, for me, I will see oftentimes a particular just picture or an image, and then I just kind of like to get myself fascinated in what's behind that image. 
So it may be a scene, or it may be a, 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 an act, a fight, or a conflict, or something that happens that I go, oh. And just as you write in your imagination, you want to start even going back to this gentleman's question here. Well, you know, what, why would I see that? What, what would be his situation? And then what's the best two words that any writer can really ask themselves is what if, right? So sometimes for me, like the inspiration for Redbird was to say, well, what if this particular situation happened? And I'm not going to tell you because it spoils the whole twist of my book. <laughs> but if, what if this were to happen? And then that twist was enough for me to say, well, who, who are these people that are involved in this twist? And why? And what's the backstory? And what's you know what would be the impetus of making that decision? Why would that decision ever be made? And so then, as I'm writing, and and Adele probably can say this too, and Jesslyn, as she's read through her books as well, can say characters will just sometimes surface in your mind that you can either plot out and say, okay, now at this particular part of the story, I have to introduce character Alpha, you know, or whatever it is. But then, as you're writing they will come up and, and then their voice will start to be heard and they can inspire you and they may change, right? So you may start writing a character and say, I don't like the way he's speaking or I don't like the way she's behaving with other characters and you can scrap it and just totally change your character perspective. But the inspiration is that first thing that gets you excited to write it in the first place, right? Is that, is that just random things you see or? Can uh, be, uh, or for sure. Just, I've never had like a dream, you know, I've never had a dream. Some people, has anybody ever dreamt something and then woke up and said, ooh, I want to write about that, so that's one way. For me, it's just random. I mean, we don't just write when we sit in front of our computer or in front of our tablet. You write as you're walking out, you know, you see the way that these little flowers and things of bloom are, are you know, poking over the, uh, the, the, the windows here, and you can start to see that and say, well, how would I write that into a book? You're writing just by thinking about it. Given the choice, I would absolutely try to get it traditionally published just because marketing is a pain and I don't really want to take care of it. But I mean, what I've heard recently is that even if you do get traditionally published nowadays, you still have to do a lot of the marketing yourself. So it's like, I don't really know if that's a plus. It's like, I would count on getting it traditionally published for the publicity, but um, otherwise I really like having control over like what is on the covers and what the final say of what goes into the book rather than changing so much just to appeal to a wider audience. The goal is traditional publishing, 100%. Uh, when I do this, I want my work to get out there for sure, and um, but I want that personal goal of having a company behind it and saying this is good enough to, to sell. So that's my goal, for sure. Do you guys know any authors who are not, are, are like driving into self-publishing and saying this is what I want to do, I don't know, no interest in self-publishing I don't know them personally. But um. I've done a, an indie author interview series on my blog, and some of them have said that they would much prefer to be self-published for the rest of their career rather than doing it traditionally. Well, royalties are higher, for sure. Yeah. I mean, awesome. How much does it cost to self-publish? Um, create space is free. Yeah. I, I didn't spend any money. Create space is create free? Space. Well, I, pay, I pay quite a bit to create space. I did you do um, the, like, the, what's it called? Yeah, the, if you go through their tools to help you design covers and things and you pay oh. for that, that's one way. I did everything. Yeah. I didn't pay anything to get my book published. No, I didn't. I didn't want help. Apparently, you did. To, yeah. So, um, yeah, if you need the services of, like, Create Space to format your book and get a book cover, <laughs> then... It's going I don't know how much it is, but it's gonna cost you some money. But then if you wanna like do other things like you have to pay for marketing for like yeah. blog tours or if you're gonna pay your cover artist like I did, or your voice acting friends to voice in your trailers, then that's gonna cost some money. Yeah. But and then you know, like business cards and right. stuff yeah. like that. So it's like you need to buy your books. You know, you yeah, buy your books. Yeah. You need to keep an inventory of it. So that's just um I mean, it could cost you nothing at all if you are adept at technology and um, formatting your own book and making your own cover like it 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 can cost you nothing at all but it's you know if you want to make it pretty and try to market it that's where the money right. comes in so you guys have any questions 
Yeah, create space is print on demand. So there's like no limit on how no lower limit on how much you can no minimum on how much you can buy. Yeah. So you can just buy one book for yourself. Yeah. Or you can buy as you know a thousand or something. Um, so yeah, but there's also Lulu, which does paperback uh, hardcover Hard books. Back. Yeah. And there's also Book Baby, which I haven't actually tried. And and Ingram's Spark. Ingram's Spark, yeah. I haven't messed with that either. But those are for the print books. Yeah. Do you guys want to know about e-books? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Underwhelming response. <laughs> well, anyway, so there's like three big ones that um, I've used, which is, you're not, do you have e books? Only Kindle. Okay, so there's Kindle Direct Publishing, which is through Amazon, and it's only Amazon. So um, they also have... Nook Press? Yeah, Nook Press and Smashwords. I find that Nook Press is not user friendly. No. And if you go to Smashwords, they kind of publish it to, to Nook anyway. So you might as well do it through Smashwords. Yeah. However, Smashwords takes a higher percentage of the sales than if you go directly through Nook Press. But Nook Press is such a pain that you might as well just do it through Smashwords and save yourself the trouble. Yeah. And then iBooks, too. There's Apple iBooks. Really? I haven't done it. Cause I haven't done it either. I know Smash Roots, like, they publish it too. I think it does it too, yeah. Um, what's the difference in what you charge for a physical book versus an e-book? Uh, mine are fourteen ninety nine for paperback, and then it's nine ninety nine for Kindle. Uh, but then whenever I do stuff like this, I always do the Kindle price. I do $10. So. Um, yeah, they're, oh, mine's 12 14 and 16 so uh, that's that. Mostly I put the cost because of how much it takes to manufacture. Mm -hmm. And then my ebooks are much lower. They're like $2.99 to $4.99. Yeah. I would recommend CreateSpace. Mm -hmm. they're, they're very user friendly. Yeah. And there's always somebody there to answer the phone and they really Oh, yeah, try they have an excellent you. customer service. Yeah, yeah. they've they just been wonderfully helpful. Like, I've had some. But like my first ever print of books, they were like a quarter of an inch too small, and I'm like, what, what, what's wrong with it? And they're like, oh, don't worry about it. We'll send you free copies. Yeah, I'm like, oh. same, same with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they create space has excellent customer service. I think Amazon in general does, but they just yeah. take so much. It's phenomenal. Um, well, you both mentioned Amazon. If you Published through Amazon? Are you like stuck with Amazon? Can you also publish the uh, same book through another uh, place? They have a certain program which is them only and it's exclusive to Amazon. However, um, if you do that, you can get pre orders on your ebooks and then they also have um, specials where they put it for like 99 cents or free and they promote it, promote it that way. But you have to be exclusive to Amazon, and if they find your book elsewhere, then they're just going to kick you out of the program, and you're not Aww. eligible for it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Or you can do, if you publish in CreateSpace, it's primarily locks it into Amazon, but you can do what's called a expanded distribution. Is that yeah. Right? And then what that'll do is allow it to other carriers can order it through Ingram and, and stock their shelves, and you know, bookstores can even order it. And everything. You guys have any experience with the Kindle Select program, or did you guys just? That's really what that is. Yeah, if you do the KDP Select program, that is uh, what Adele was talking about, where ebooks specifically will go as a primary only exclusive with Amazon, and then they will allow, they'll do some kind of special promotion for you. Did you guys actually try that? I did not. No. I did it for the, like, the pre-order period, but after that, like, like I'm not going to make it exclusive to Amazon, so I, once it was available for sale and all free ordering um, yeah. made it available elsewhere. Yeah. I have a little bit of a relationship with Barnes & Noble too, so I wanted to, and, and I don't get very good royalties from them, but I just like the fact that it's getting to them as well. Yeah. Well, we're past 11.30, so we've been here for more than an hour now, oh, gosh. Um, and I'm happy to have you guys continue if you want to continue, but I have got somewhere to be. So. <laughs> So I am going to be leaving. Okay. Um, before I do, I know that there was a question earlier about getting your book into the library. So if you have a copy of your book, how do you, who do you give it to, and what do you do to see it become a library book? And um, for that, 
Your book needs to get donated with a specific form, and I've put some copies of the form on our table over here with some flyers. Um, so donate your book to the library with that form. Your book and the form goes to a um, selection committee that's age appropriate. So if you have a children's book, it goes to a committee of children's librarians. And they make the determination based on if your book is appropriate for, for the library, um, if it's of local interest, if it's, um, if it's going to be an, a good addition to our collection, and how well written it is. Cool. Well, and then just from, I mean, I'll speak on behalf of us, too. I mean, thank you to everybody for coming out, too, you know, for spending your Saturday morning, and thank you to Jennifer for, you know, organizing thank this. I think it's great to be able to get back <laughs> in the library and things like that. So. I think there's one more question here. Yeah, yeah, you guys pursue um, reviewers and contests or schools in particular to fill out your usual duties with your books at all, or...? Um. I, I'm also a, an employee with the school district, so I have gone to the schools as well, and um, RMEO has my books, and they're, I used to, I was a student there as well, and so that was something that I did, and I was supposed to do a talk to some of the element uh, English classes at RMEO, but that didn't happen. However, I am um, volunteering at Green Valley Middle School at their creative writing class there, and um, I've done like a reading at the beginning of the semester, and I'm like going in every now and then to like help the students with their own writing. Yeah, that's right. I've done a couple of readings for local schools in Vacaville. I'm from Vacaville, and then um, uh, a couple of uh, website reviews that I reached out to from Relationship from Prior, LifeIsStory.com did a couple of good reviews, and then just really trying to solicit reviews on Amazon from friends and family. I did never. I never did a contest. Huh? No, because usually that requires a fee, and I just don't want to pay you that. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But I, um, as for like book bloggers, I have like tried to contact some of them. Like, hey, you review young adult fantasy. Do you want to review my book? And that has like come with like varying success. Like most of the time, they just ignore my email. Yeah. <laughs> You can just go in cold turkey, and, or if you know somebody, that's better still. But I've just gone, gone in, screwed up my little coot's paw I had, <laughs> gotten in there, and, and you, you'll sometimes you'll get rejections, and that's okay. Yeah. But but more more uh, likely than not, you you'll get uh, accepted, or they'll let you in. Or consider you at least. It's true. We want to make sure that we respect your guys' time as well. So, I mean, did you want to shift like to the back, Adele, or is there anything else that you uh, wanted to hammer? With? Yeah. Did, were there any other questions that anybody had about anything? Uh, not a question. Thank you for coming and talking to us today. It's been great. Thank you, thank you for Thanks coming. <laughs> Specific questions. I mean, we can kind of just hold up there in the back, and you know, feel free to come back and, and talk to us.